Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, have to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Right back toward the hole. How about in? That's the second eagle he's made it for this week. <laughs> 17 years later, Hal Sutton is the players' champion. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Be The Right Club Today podcast. Hal, did you enjoy the Masters? I did enjoy the Masters, although I think it could have been a little bit better. Almost was a little bit better. Yeah, it was It was one of those events you thought, man, this is going to get crazy. And then, you know, the it was starting to come up to an apex on 16, and Shoffley hits the shot, and then it was just done. It was, it was finished. Yeah. Uh, you know, the beginning, too, if, uh, you know, if Will had been playing in the last group, yeah, he starts out birdie birdie, and uh, Hideki. Hideki makes the bogey at number one and blocks it way right. He was obviously very nervous because yeah. he didn't even release it, and uh, you know you start like that, and the other guy starts hot. It's going to change things, but yeah. that's golf. That's uh, why pairings are the way they are. And absolutely, I was surprised by two things. You touched on you touched on Hideki being nervous. He you know he mentioned that in the interview. You know Jim Jim Nance asked him how how nervous he was down the stretch, and he said he was nervous from the from the beginning. Did you have tournaments where you were kind of you know in the last group and where you, you where you felt you were on edge the whole time? Uh, you know, early on in my career, there were tournaments where I was really nervous in the beginning because I wasn't sure that I was good enough. Yeah. And I, I bet Hideki had a little bit of that feeling to start out. You know, am I really good enough to do this? Uh, he probably won't feel that way the next time because yeah. he's already proven to himself that he is. <clears throat> but as you begin to you know season you yeah. know you talk about marinate yeah right. use that word a lot with all the kids in here you know as you season as a player and you become mature you you know how good you are mm-hmm. and uh, you believe in it yeah. and so you you're less nervous because you know i can handle this talk briefly about xander's shot on 16 you know we talked on on monday about this you know he said in the post i heard him say in the post in an interview that he flushed it when the camera went to his face originally, I thought, "Uh oh, it didn't." He didn't look like he was just, you know, he loved it. Well, there's a lot of things about that that I'm not sure I'd love to sit down and talk to him about it. Yeah. When you birded four in a row, <laughs> and, and you flush it, it's never short. Yeah, and that would be my first yeah, answer that's, right that's well there. Said. And especially from 160, yeah. well, you know, 55, 160. Yeah. And you know, I, I think he would like. To believe it was probably flush, I don't think it was quite flush. Yeah. I mean, he he's one of the great ball strikers yeah. out there. And, you know, pulling it there, um, I mean, he should have never been aimed over there, you know. And that's a, to your point. If he did pull it, it would go further anyway. Exactly. It sounded it just something about it. He didn't see. I thought yeah. he just mishit it just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And not to take anything away from, Z- I mean, you know, or, or Hideki or whatever, like Xander burning four in a row, like, I I I feel I felt like he was gonna hit it five or six feet. Like I was just waiting for him to hit him to hit it six feet and then see how a deck he was gonna react. And then he hits it in the water. And he, I mean, I I felt bad for him. You know. Well, it was a Masters. Yeah. It's a tough place, and uh, you know, I, I was sixteen. Honestly, when the pin is on the left, is really not that hard a shot. Yeah. It's the kind of shot that if you hit it down your line, it might have a chance to go in. Yeah. And uh, you know. We talk about it in the podcast with Scott about, you know, aiming every time at the slope. Right. Use the slope. So, perfect segue. So, you, you mentioned Will. So, Will Zal- Zalatoris, um, our, our next guest, um, you know, knows Will really well. Kind of kind of watched him grow up. Um, Cotted for Will in the uh, U.S. Amateur to when, when Will won the U.S. Amateur. And then 
he won another big event, either the pub links or, or wherever else. He mentions it in the pod ha- podcast. But anyway, it's it's Scott Fawcett, and Scott created a system called Decade Golf. And if you haven't heard of Decade, you know we're a big fan of it. It's a it's a great way to keep your stats. It's a great way to help you understand course management a little bit better. And and Hal and I have known Scott for four or five years now, and been a fan. And and uh, as you'll you'll hear in the podcast don't always necessarily completely agree with everything that he says but his stuff is really interesting and he's on the on the forefront of 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 how to use data to play better golf well you know nobody in business out there is not using data yeah and you know that's the one thing that i wish i had was more data from yep. when i was playing golf and nobody has to live through that anymore And Scott's one of those guys that's created a way for you to really analyze what you're doing and to figure out where you need to aim the ball with the highest percentage of pulling off the shot. So I'd listen to Scott on this. Uh, I think that sometimes, I mean, the one area where Scott and I am not 100% on board with each other is, is I think there's sometimes we get faced with one shot that could change our whole life. And that's a gut decision when you get there. That's exactly right. And it's not necessarily written down on paper anywhere yep. how to play that shot. Yep. I had a couple of those in my life, and so has everybody else. So, and you guys talked about it and touched on it. So you guys listen in, enjoy. Uh, Scott Fawcett with Decade Golf. All right, our next guest on the Be The Right Club Today podcast has developed a, developed a system for helping players score better from – Tour pros to high level or to high level amateurs to high handicaps. He's helped players all over the world, given seminars. He's he's developed a system called Decade. We've talked about it a little bit on, on here. Um, How and I have have known Scott Fawcett for you know four or five years now. Had a lot of good conversations with him. Um, Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. And and we're going to assume that a lot of our listeners know a little bit about or a lot about what you do. But um, you know, talk about it. Talk about you know, kind of the how you how you develop decade and uh, and what you're up to. Sure, thank you, and thanks you guys for having me on there. It really is still kind of surreal to uh, to have a guy like Hal Sutton and yourself want to actually talk to me about golf. It's pretty pretty funny considering most of this is somewhat of an accident. But anyways, you know, I'm your typical you know 47 year old guy that grew up in Dallas, Texas, that played all the sports growing up until uh, I got hit in football one day and was like, well, that kind of sucks and started taking golf a little bit more seriously, but it was late enough that I, I only played one AJG in my life. So I wasn't really heavily recruited. I went to Sam Houston and then transferred to Texas A&M. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's so funny looking back at it because I really would have been the perfect test case for what I teach now. And I, I say so often that what I, I teach, what I teach so well, because I was so bad at it. So here I'm a guy that didn't really play much high school golf. I went to college and I won a couple times, but I, I broke my leg playing basketball halfway through my red shirt junior year and didn't even play golf my last year and a half of college. Naturally, I turned professional, even though I'd probably only played in 40 golf tournaments in my life at that point. What else would you uh, would you do? But I mean, I won 10 times on like the Hooters tour and every tour except for the ones you actually want to win on. So I would say it was a moderately successful um, run. And and honestly, I traveled with Chad Campbell and Chris Riley, you know, in the late 90s on the Hooters tour. And I always felt like I was as good as them. But I really just, you know, again, I won a couple times on the Hooters tour, but Chad won every other week. And I never could figure it out. And in hindsight, I just... I never got the experience to really of, of playing a lot of golf. And, and really the problem is, is that golf is the only sport in the world that's not played on a uniform field of competition. So instruction, you know, it's, it's not the instructor's fault, but it's just a really hard game to teach people to play. And to be perfectly honest to most other former instructors or current instructors, if you haven't played the game at the highest level, like a guy like Hal, a lot of what you're giving for course management knowledge is just like what you think is right. I mean, you, you have no idea if it's right or wrong. At least Hal was out there and did it and like, this is what I did. Now, whether or not it was mathematically optimal, you know, is, but he won a bunch. And so it's, it's just a hard game to teach. So, you know, I, I, I played for six years and I quit and started an electricity company and actually started working in my golf game with Chris Como. Uh, we, we met playing an underground poker room here in Dallas in 2003. And it really is funny when you take it and look at all the pieces of this puzzle as they come together and you start seeing all the similar names in this, you know, modern golf, if you will, instruction or theory standpoint. And so 
got to where I was playing pretty good. I decided it, when I was 35 in 2008 that I wanted to go back and try again. My electricity company was kind of running itself. So I entered Q school as a 35 year old amateur, got through all four stages of Q school, which apparently is easier to do with a full-time job than actually then trying to play professional golf with a full-time job. So I just kind of screwed around for about three years as unsuccessfully and a lot of good rounds and a lot of rusty rounds. So uh, it was fun, but when I got my amateur status back the second time in 2013 was right when Mark Brody's book, Every Shot Counts, was coming out. They had already released all of the strokes gained putting statistics. And when I understood what was coming out with the book, I was like, dude, I could take all of these new stats and all this TrackMan shot pattern data and essentially create a generic shot pattern of various levels of players and then combine it with these strokes gain statistics and then just a little Excel, I, I would like to say computer programming to sound smarter than I am, but just a bunch of blood, sweat and tears in Excel. And I mean, honestly, I was doing it for my own game, but then the, the week before the Texas Amateur in 2014, I got a cortisone shot and the guy paralyzed my right arm for a couple of days. And that's the only reason I called Will Zalatoris, who was just a 17 year old kid at my club at the time. I'm like, you know, I, I really think I've created something pretty cool as strategy. You're one of the best ball strikers as we're all now seeing on the planet. And that was even at 17, but for whatever reason, you're just, you, you can't figure out scoring. And obviously he, he struggles with the putter sometimes and it was worse back then. And so I just had always assumed as a friend that that's what the problem was. But basically once you get out there and get on the golf course with him, you just realize he has no clue how to actually score. And he's such a great ball striker that he thinks he can hit any shot basically trying to birdie every hole. And it's funny because he used to post on Twitter and whatever all the time, like interesting card, just the biggest disaster cards ever. Six birdies, an eagle, a double, a triple, and the rest bogeys to shoot even. It's like, dude, that's just not how the game works at the highest level. And, and so, like, you know, I caddied for him when he won the Texas Am and U.S. Junior that summer. And then only because of luck and good fortune, Jason Enlow, the SMU coach, and I have known each other since we were, you know, in college. And he basically at the time told me that DeChambeau plays way too aggressively and kind of asked me a little bit about what I was doing. And so I really created the decade seminar basically for Bryson. Um, it's an indoor seminar that I went and gave at SMU. And a few months later, Bryson wins the NCAAs and U.S. Amateur and Next thing you know, I'm talking to Hal Sutton and Chase Cooper on a podcast because <laughs> apparently, you know, golf strategy is hard. And then the last thing I'll, I'll finish up there on the background, because I really do think this is the important point. If you'd asked me six years ago, what's going on with these young players that are doing great things, I would have said, man, I'm a genius. It's the math. It's the math. It's the math. Six years into teaching us, it's the psychology. It is 100%. The, the strategy component of it's pretty simple to teach you, but I do believe that since I'm a, you know, a, a reformed lunatic, that what I use the data for to calm players' expectations and remove emotions from decisions is really the key. And that's mainly because, you know, the prefrontal cortex in most men doesn't finish developing until you're in your, you know, mid-20s. So back in the late 90s, you know, we used to think you wouldn't get out on tour and, and start really peaking until you were around 30 because you had to get out there and learn all the shots. And I really believe what's actually going on is you have to get out there, let your brain finish developing, and then take a couple of years to start to synthesize all of this information you've acquired over 20 years in the game to then start making coherent decisions if you ever actually get to that point. Again, a guy like myself, I never made it quite to that point. I, I went broke at 27 and and never got to put it all together. So it's it's been a lot of fun to to help a lot of young players sidestep the the blood, sweat, and tears that we've all put into this damn game. Well, Scott, you know, I'm going to start by telling you I really respect what you do and, and how your approach to the game. And uh, uh, you've made me think a lot. We've had some discussions where we talked about you tell me what, you, what your thoughts were. And I said, you know, I kind of played that way. And, but I'm that guy – that had to learn it through the school of hard knocks. Really. I did not, there was not data that showed me anything. It was just doing it enough right and doing enough wrong showed me some things that I needed to, some paths that I needed to follow. Uh, you know, in every business data is important. You know, you cannot run a business without having data. And that's what has really changed in the game of golf is data. 
being available. And it's helped teachers, it's helped you, it's helped golfers, it's helped everybody, basically. So what are two or three of the things that I got wrong, my generation got wrong, that we know today to be different? And, you know, I know one of those things is angles. I hear you talk about <laughs> angles all the time. And angles meant a lot to me. And I'll tell you one quick little reason why I felt like it did, because it was a guy named Ben Hogan that told me that he looked from behind the green every time after he finished the practice round to decide where the best angle to come into that green from was. And, you know, when maybe the best player in the world ever tells you something like that, it has a big lasting effect on someone. So prove me wrong. Well, it, and again, the, the crucial point, especially in the angles conversation, it's not that they don't matter. It's that you can't chase them profitably. And what I mean by that is I'm fully aware that to, and I'm trying to think because the one pin, you know, like 13 to that front left pin, like laying it up further down there. So you've got a little bit better angle coming across at, at Augusta. I get it. I, I understand there are certain angles and laying up on par fives is one thing because you're typically laying up with a mid iron. You do have a slightly smaller shot pattern. When I really start getting into the conversation about angles, we're usually talking about drivers off the tee and you have to have this angle from the right side and shot patterns with the drivers. They're simply 65 yards wide and they're not, if you think of a normal distribution curve, they're not really tall over the middle where you hit most of your shots straight. And then the outliers are 30 yards, right? It's, you kind of hit as many balls 30 yards right as you do 30 yards left as you do right down the middle. It's, it, it really is, as long as you're keeping your shot pattern within a 65 yard wide pattern in play on the range, it should be tighter than that. You're going to get that angle. If you just aim up down the middle of the fairway, you're going to get that right side angle quite often, but most importantly, because of the design of golf courses, you just don't have many, you know, like band and dunes. There are some fairways that are a hundred yards wide. Okay, I get it, you can favor a side there, but most of the time you're gonna have a 30-ish yard wide fairway, 33 yard fair, wide fairway. You're gonna, if you've got trees on the course, there's gonna be 55 or so yards between the tree canopies. And if you start trying to take the 65 yard wide shot pattern and favor a side, Yes, you're going to get that angle, and that is important, but the, the right 15% of your tee shots that would now just be in the right rough are now in the right trees. And so when you start really looking at the overall outcome of, I'm going to, I'm going to play this hole a million times, um, it, it's similar to like a second shot into Augusta on nine, people saying, you know, you've got to be below that hole to the front pin, and, and I totally agree with that, but there's that pin like this weekend, it was cut four yards over that false front. There's just not enough room to get your ball between that false front and, and four yards on the pin. That's not an angle, but you kind of get the same idea. If, in order to not hit any above the hole, then you're going to hit some that are five yards short of the pin, and that's going 50 yards back down the fairway. That's a bad outcome. And so it really is looking at, you know, the overall, again, a million iterations of this target what is going to be the, the optimal score. And, and so it really just comes down to the design of golf courses. There's just not enough width 98% of the time. I, I, I would really want to say virtually 100% of the time, except for a place like Vanden Dunes that just has these ridiculously huge fairways. Um, but even then, you, to try to gain an angle like around a, a, a pot bunker in the middle of a fairway or something, that pot bunker is seven yards wide. If you think of this 60, and I'm, you know, I'm using my hands, which is the thing you shouldn't do on a podcast, but if you, if you think of a 65-yard wide shotgun, it's, there's nowhere you can aim it that that seven-yard bunker isn't going to be in some part of the shot pattern. It's just in place. So you might as well aim it right at it, you know, again, typically. Um, I hate making definitive statements in golf just because, again, it's the only sport in the world that's not played on a uniform court. So someone's on Twitter right now already telling me some hole where you can get around it. I, I get it there. And the 44,000 courses on the planet, there are some exceptions. But trying to pick out those exceptions and not overdo it is really the problem. And, and this is where it's interesting, like, to finish that, that idea off, and this is for sure just a psychology point. There's no way this is actually correct. But 
when the PGA Tour, Lou Stagner, my guy that runs the data, like he's unbelievable at manipulating the shot link database. He's actually now shown that if you take a pin that's five yards from the right edge or five yards from the left edge and you give the good side, the good angle, it actually plays with the higher scoring average than the bad angle because those guys, okay, green light here, I've got the angle and they get more aggressive. It, it, and again, there's no chance that's actually, cor I mean, that's correct, but there's no chance that it's actually because of the math. It's because of the psychology. Again, even these guys, and that's what's, what's so interesting about this is if you ask who's the two greatest players of all time, regardless of what camp you're in, I'm pretty sure Jack and Tiger are going to be the two names that come up. And then if you say, who are the two best course managers in the history of the game? I'm pretty sure those are the two best names that are going to come up again. And I really do believe they just somehow got it. A guy like you, you got to it eventually. Again, there's still a few fallacies in there. Um, the main one when you were talking that I was going to say was, we're, I'm just going to hit three wood here to make sure and get it in play. You just don't hit your three wood materially straighter than your driver, especially given modern technology. Back in the day, it might have been a little bit, um, a little bit more of a fair statement because those drivers were so small. But no matter what, maybe you're hitting five or seven percent more fairways with your three wood, but you're hitting it 40 or 50 yards longer 100 percent of the time. And that math just, it just won't pan out. And, you know, like number three at Augusta, again, back to, to Lou Stagner, people talking about laying up, laying back, well, to that left pin, you got to lay up. And luckily, Justin Rose and Hideki saved me a lot of time of having to explain variance and a million iterations of a shot, because it's not a given you're going to hit that fairway from the, the green from, I'll give you ball in hand, go to, go to whatever number you want. Um, and it's not going to play easier. So, the players that went for it this year, and again, their average score was 4.11, but the 36 that laid up was 4.31. It literally, over the, in 2020, 21 players to this left pin laid up with an average, or went for it rather, with an average score of 3.81. 39 laid up with an average score of 4.23. 2019, the exact same numbers, a quarter of a shot. And it really is, I get it, that you can get yourself in a really funky spot if you get it up and around the green, but just like Zalatoris showed, he hit a bad pitch and was just in the back fringe. Hideki hit a bad shot or Justin Rose hit a bad shot and was 15 yards over the green and, and is then just lucky to hit the green on his chip shot. I mean, that thing you can chip right off the front of the green just as easy as anything. So it really, it's really just about seeing a million iterations of a shot. It's why the, it's why the house wins money in gambling. There's just certain things that it's like, well, I know you're going to win money every once in a while, but if we do this bet a million times, I'm going to win 40, you know, 51.9% of the time. And man, that's not a very big edge, but it's enough to build <laughs> millions and millions of hotel rooms on, on the Vegas Strip. And that's really all that the data allows us to turn golf into. So, so Scott, a quick follow-up to that. Obviously, in Blackjack, the cards don't care what your commitment level is, but on the golf course, we obviously, like if – if you have, and you can use Augusta as, as an example, if we need to use three as an example, it's not the best one because that, that hole's pretty, pretty open. But take a, take a hole that your players have played where, you know, the, the data says driver, but some of the guys are like, man, I'm not super comfortable hitting driver there. I'd rather hit three wood or I'd rather hit iron. H how does that conversation go? And do you just say, look, guys, the mass says driver, bow up and hit driver? I don't back down, yeah. I mean, again, I, I, I will give them, dude, heat of the moment, you're the player. Like I fully understand, like, dude, I just feel that. Okay. That's fine. But I'm going to be very clear. The math says this. And if you know what I'll basically tell them is you get kind of one or two overrides around, I would very rarely tell them to override something off of a T, but you know, into a green, they're just not liking something to just get an, an, a couple yards more conservative rarely would I say it's okay to get a couple of yards more aggressive on an approach shot, which is exactly what Xander showed us on 16. You cannot hit a good golf shot. And, you know, maybe he's fibbing to us a little bit. I don't think so. The swing looked good. Strike sounded good. He didn't have a crazy off balance follow through. I think he hit a pretty good shot and he just had a terrible target. If he actually, it's just so funny how often it works out. If he had gone with the correct target, which should be about six or eight yards right of the, of the Sunday pin on 16 at Augusta. 
the, the shot that he actually hit, about a four-yard pull, he probably hits it inside of two feet. If he just happens to hit that shot with the correct target, instead he makes triple. And, and it's just, again, game theory in golf, because it's, again, the only sport that you don't play defense. There's not a shared clock. You, know, you, you don't know what the winning score is going to be. You don't know what your opponent is up to. It's just a really hard game, you know, like Hideki laying up, or, you know, going for it on 15. I was on Wharton's Moneyball podcast yesterday, and you got four pretty smart math guys sitting there talking about it, and we could debate it to the, to the end of time whether or not it's correct for him to lay up or go for it, Hideki on 15. And so if we can't figure it out after the fact with perfect information, there's just no way you're going to figure it out in real time. So you just have to stick to your guns. You have to know that winning – a major championship is hard. And so Xander, yeah, you probably do need to make a birdie coming in, dude. Maybe it'll be on 16, maybe it'll be on 17, maybe it'll be on 18. But if you make triple on 16, the last two holes are totally irrelevant. And this gets back to something we were talking about before without segueing into it too easy, money versus wins. I totally understand Xander Shoffley has more money than he could ever spend already at 27 years of age. But there are other things involved in, you know, winning. And again, I really am biting my tongue on this one. I'm being as, as utopian as possible by saying there are other things. There's only one thing to do at the Masters in that situation, and it's when I want to be very clear on that. But for the typical player in the typical tournament, there is so much more riding on it. Top 50 gets you into the majors. Top whatever gets you your card, gets you into the different levels of the FedEx Cup. Helps you keep your card, helps you keep top 150. There's just so much more to it than all out. My only care is winning. And again, I say that for the standard event in, in Xander's situation there, I'm fully aware he would give away all prize money to win the green jacket, but it's just not quite that tidy all the time. Oh. So, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you, yeah, your thoughts. Uh, you said that there's a couple of times that you override. Uh, there's a player could override. Uh, I've said continuously that there are moments in a player's career where a mistake at the wrong time could shape him for a year or two. Uh, I, I'll use uh, Jordan Spieth for this. I think number 12 shaped the future for Jordan Spieth for a little while at Augusta. And he's overcome that now, but boy, you have to, uh, you, you can get shell shocked out there if <laughs> something happens to you at the wrong time. And that is the 15th club. That's the gut and the mind. And so let's talk about this overriding thing that you're talking about. So, you know, decade, we work off of the edge of the green for starters. So, you know, the traditional playing lesson advice is where's the right spot to miss it. And this is where actually people think that I'm Mr. Conservative middle of the green. Like I want you to be as aggressive as physically possible. When we've got a shorter iron in our hand, that baseline number gets smaller. So we're attacking more pins when you're inside that 120 to 140 range, which again, on the PGA tour, 140 yards in the fairways where they average 2.91 strokes to hole out. Like, I get it, par's not great, but it only loses you .09 shots. It's not the end of the world. And so it's just really hard to pick those spots where you should be getting more aggressive, but where you can is, and again, I actually said it on, before Will hit his tee shot on 13, um, I would, he, he only draws the driver, but that's a situation where the, he, he would actually make more eagles by hitting driver there instead of three wood because he could get it up there an extra 50 yards, have a shorter club in his hand, have a flatter lie. Like it's just hard to make eagle on 13 from back there with a hanging lie at <coughs> 200, you know, plus yards. That would be a situation, but, but I will also say the only reason I would say he could draw driver there is his miss is probably going to be just through the fairway, in which case he can still lay up. He can maybe get a Mickelson line. Like he's not being overly, excuse me, aggressive where he's just bringing six into play. I mean, yes, there's a small chance he overcooks it and makes six, but on average, that's not my biggest concern with him hitting driver there. So that would be a situation like an override. But it's interesting, as you were talking about Jordan on 12, 
not only can it shape his, but I would be perfectly honest. I would be surprised. Like people ask me what my relationship with Will is now. And I mean, I've taught him everything I know. Like he's got it. <laughs> you know, I caddied for the guy for four years while he was finishing his amateur careers in, in the summer tournaments. Like there's nothing else I have to teach the guy. Now my job is to get him to spend his money as stupidly as possible and buy dumb stuff. That's, that's all I'm here for as a mentor. But there are a couple shots every once in a while that I'm just like, I got to ask. And one of them is going to be his, his, his shot on 12 on Sunday. If he had hit it short right in the water, I'd be like, just a bad shot, whatever. But the fact he hit it short left, just with the way shot patterns are, it's a really strange shot. And the reason that's the one shot I'm going to ask to hit him about is his playing partner, Will had his ball in the air literally 24 seconds after his playing partner's ball hit the green. And one of the great things about decade and decisive you know, moments is like, dude, we've talked about number 12 since you were 17 years old. It's just inside the lip of the bunker. It's to the dead center of the green yardage wise. There's not much to think about. But he did hit that one so fast and it was such a, a just a strange outcome of a shot that I am curious if Jordan, if Molinari, Kepka, Finau, dude, that's all we've seen since 2016 is people screwing up that shot. And I wouldn't be surprised if Will's like, dude, I was over that shot and it felt so easy and I felt so dumb for not getting a little bit more aggressive, but I knew I wasn't, that's not right. And like, he's just fighting all these internal demons. Like I would be stunned if that's not what was going on in his head right there. But but what I often say to players, if, if I happen to be right on that one, is if I can tell that from my office in Dallas, you've got to be man enough to figure out how on the 12th tee at Augusta in the final round to back off of that shot. If you're having, you know, the main thing, I, I do try to get people playing fast, but, and, and they, you don't have to back off a shot. Like if you're just daydreaming, you don't have to back off of it, just refocus. But if you're over the shot and you're thinking don't, any form of the word don't, don't go right, don't go left, you know, I don't know exactly what this wind is. I don't know if this club is the right one. That's a start over. That's get out, start over, because you can't overcome a don't. Totally agree with you on that. I uh, I think that too many players, you said you don't, you encourage faster play because you don't want people overthinking the shot. There's a strategy that you've created. Let's stick to the strategy and let's not, allow ourselves to think about the negative things that are out there. I couldn't agree with that more. When you see someone go real fast, that's because they're scared of something most of the time. Something. I mean, that's all I was thinking about while you were talking about Jordan affecting Jordan. I'm like, I would, I will bet my life that that carried forward into 2019. I don't remember what happened in 17 and 18, but after, I mean, Lou Stagner again, I'm, I'm now I'm just having a Lou Stagner promotion thing, but he made a, uh, a Lego with his daughter. It's amazing. It's like the size of a, of a bathroom door of number 12. And even in this Lego thing, it's 20,000 Legos. It's incredible. But even then he made these little figurines and it was a red and black tiger up on the green and his caddy and then Molinari and Brooks back there dropping them. Like that's actually really <laughs> funny, but it's just, it's so brilliant to just watch tiger, just put the simplest, most, committed swing possible again the the thing that i come back to all the time and i've got it up on my youtube channel is just this this time when tiger was in the booth at the hero and they asked him you know tiger over the course of your career do you, would you consider yourself do you play more aggressively or more conservatively now as you're a more seasoned player and he's like oh i play very aggressively i've always played aggressively and i'm just listening I'm like wrong but he finished the statement with but i play aggressively to my spots so wherever i choose that spot to be maybe a little more on the conservative side, I'm playing aggressively to it. And I'm like, that's what nobody else does. Pick that spot, trust the variance. Like I get it. You'd like to make a birdie on 12, but guess what? It's probably not going to happen for a right-handed player. Again, shot patterns tend to be, I don't care if you play a fade or a draw shot patterns tend to be long left and short, right? 12 just doesn't fit it. And that's you know, getting back to Spieth in 2016 after the round, he said, I was just standing over the shot. I felt so good. And it was so perfect that I just thought I was just going to push it over there by the pin. If you think of a shot pattern of an ellipse, he's literally trying to push it into the long right portion of a shot pattern. That shot doesn't exist. I would rather you, at least Molinari, 
like committed to firing at it. I'd rather you know, I'd rather you do that. You don't need to do that either, but I'd rather you do that than aim at the middle and try to push it long right because that shot has literally no chance of of working out. And it's funny because a guy like you that won as often great as great as you were, I would bet even you had times that you aimed towards the middle, but then thought, I kind of hope I pull it or push it by the flag. And is that a shot you thought you ever really had? I, that's actually, I'm curious to know a guy like you. Uh, there were many times that I was aimed at the middle of the green and hoped that it ended up closer to the flag, whether I could do it through ground movement. Sometimes you're able to do that. You know, one of the things that we haven't talked about is, is ground movement. You know, that, that can alter where the ball ends up. No uh, doubt as far as the green is concerned. And I, I can tell you, I used that a lot to maneuver the ball to the hole. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's so much more to play in golf and to see someone like you narrow the focus like you have. Uh, you know, it took me years to understand. And when we first talked in uh, Palm Beach uh, that time, you know, you were saying things that I understood, but you figured it out mathematically, and I had figured it out through the school of hard knocks, basically. Yeah. And you you captured my attention from that. You know, one of the things that I want to bring up is, let's go to Lee Westwood this year, TPC, 17th hole. Mm -hmm. Bryson, too. Also Bryson. Yeah, and Bryson, too. Uh, neither one of those guys shot at that flag. And, you know, if I'd have been Lee Westwood's caddy, and I like Lee, I'm not, this is not, uh, I'm not talking about him when I say this. I would have encouraged Lee, this is a moment in time you're never going to get again. Maybe. It's, it's seize the moment right here. And, I mean, I played with Tiger Woods in 2000, and he got to that hole, and he was one shot behind me. And let me tell you right where that ball started. <laughs> right at that pin because he did not care about finishing second. He listen, nobody remembers who finished his second. That'll be forgotten in time quickly. And you know, See, there I, are those I, moments. I, I, go ahead. Well, there are those moments where you got to seize the moment. And I think that was at 47 years old, that was a Lee Westwood moment. And I'd encouraged him to seize that moment. So this would be a situation where, so, so Decade would have you aiming about 11 yards, 10 yards from the right edge of that green. Um, that would be a situation where you could override it a yard or two, but this is, and, and, and again, like I've looked at that hole in Tiger, every single shot that Tiger has hit in the final round to that pin, and I get it, this situation was unique. It was before shot length, so I don't have that one. From 2004 through 2020, I've looked at them all. And they're literally just all over the green. Um, I would bet that that shot Tiger hit right at it was a little bit right of his target. And this is really the key, the, the key to the math, especially on that particular shot. You literally will make as many. And I would honestly, I, I feel like I could actually safely argue more birdies by aiming it 10 yards left of the edge of the green than you would by aiming it right at it you might have a slightly longer birdie putt on average, but you will have more of them. And the real key to it also is one back with two to go. I, I get it. It would be nice to birdie that hole, but you, you, you don't have to, you can also try again on 18 and maybe the situation sets up a little bit better. Maybe you make bogey on one of the two, like there's just more to it. That's a unique spot. You guys are in the last group. You do know what each other are up to. So you are playing with, you know, a, a shared clock. You know when the game ends um, and you are getting to watch what your opponent does. But even still, I mean, a five foot putt on the PGA Tour is 75%. Even if you had hit a nice shot up there and, and you had kept it above the ridge because you're playing conservative to win, your putt is going five feet past that hole. Like you're three putting from up there a ton. And Scott, it's, I have been there. I oh, hit that shot right. when I, I was hit tiger it into was the there. Side <laughs> but I had to leave. Yes. And I was, and let me tell you something. I was playing just right of the slope. I was hoping the slope would help the ball maneuver no the flag. 
So I agree with your aim point, but, you know, I think it's mindset it's, more than anything else. I, I, and I, I totally agree with that. And so one thing that I, I used to be in the first couple of years of teaching this, I was very dogmatic. Some people would call it a little rough around the edges, but I, I was like, this is how the math works. Take it or leave it. I understand your point, but take it or leave it. I have definitely backed off of that and said, I need you to figure out how to feel aggressive while creating a shot pattern that probably wouldn't be typically thought of as aggressive. And that's why, I mean, honestly, on my decade card that I have here, you know, I, I had it originally and I, I used the same, the exact same card for four years. And, and last year I changed it and I updated the side with the mental stuff. And I put the top quote is Tigers. I am very aggressive, but I'm aggressive to my spot. So wherever I choose that same quote, because that is the most important piece of information I've learned in seven years now of doing this. And so I, I, and I agree, it's a really hard thing to pick out that spot seven yards left of the pin and then attack it like it's the hole. I mean, you, you may not know this. I, I entered Q school as a 35 year old amateur. I entered Q school last year also kind of as a joke. I just wanted to play some more golf, but I shot 11 under for the seven rounds that I played and I finished fifth at uh that pre Q and then, you know, missed by a couple at first stage, which considering I'm 46 and don't play golf and not even a member of the country club, I did that all with my brain. But what I was really trying to figure out is like, you know, I had just played in the U S mid and it was really my first competitive golf in a while. I'm like, I just, I really want to play in a tournament with pins that are just three and four from the edge, like they do at Q school for 72 straight holes, because I want to see how hard it is to aim away from it and not see the pin. And I truly, and I've been saying this for a while, I truly believe the skill of not seeing the pin is the hardest one in, in PGA Tour golf. The physical stuff like that, especially with modern instruction, like it's actually not that hard to hit the ball pretty damn good. But getting out there and playing and, and not seeing the pin and not letting it be a distraction, because it's really not the target very often, the, the actual target. And so really getting people to understand how to get that aggressive, that Hal Sutton mindset, like I'm, today's the day I'm going to go out and do this. Okay. And the best way to make the most amount of birdies on number 17 at Sawgrass is six or seven yards left. Same thing. The best way to make a bunch of birdies on 16 at Augusta is seven or eight right. Yes, there are slopes there to help funnel the ball to the hole, which just makes it even more the play. But even without those slopes, those targets would still be the same. And that's, again, it's a really hard, for sure, without the slope there on 17, you would make more birdies with a target six yards right than right at it. Like that's, it's not even close because so many of those 20, 25 foot putts that would be right at the top of the slope are now, you know, not great makeable birdies, but they're legitimate makeable birdies um, as opposed to you just obviously have no chance from the water. And I, I really think, Again, you just don't ever know what's going to happen. Xander's out there. He's birdied five, four in a row, and he's thinking, I'm king of the world. I'm going to go birdie 16. I'm going to hit a hole in one. Oh, yeah, well, you also made triple. Like, it's just he just got out over skis a little bit. And it's a tough one because I do agree with you. The mindset of attacking. And I'll say, like, Maverick McNeely is a guy that I worked with, you know, in college and when he first got out on the PJ Tour, like with a, a four- or five-year period there. And I'll say I screwed Maverick up in his putting his, his last year of college. He was a plus like 0.4 stroke gain putter in the decade app. And he was just hammering me. I want something to work on. I'm like, dude, you're pretty good across the board. You're number one in the world right now. Like, I don't really have a whole lot to tell you other than keep doing that. And he just kept demanding it. And so I was like, you know what? Maybe you could make a few more putts from 20 to 30 feet, whatever it was. Like I literally turned over a rock and and I, I told him to do that by actually leaving more putts short, which is counterintuitive. He was being a little bit too aggressive, making the hole a little bit too small. And then his putting got totally screwed up because now he's out there thinking on something. I'm like, dude, you're a plus 0.4 stroke game putter. Just do what you're doing. But then he started trying to think and adjust and get better. And sometimes it's like, that's, that's a fool's errand at, at best. And so I definitely, what, what we wound up, the reason I brought him up was I wound up showing him this, this, this video that I made on Phil Mickelson where he's talking about, I putted very aggressively this week. You know, it, it, was, it was one of his best putting weeks ever at Safeway a couple of years ago. And if you think of Phil Mickelson saying, I putted aggressively, 
he's not leaving many short, I assume, is what most people would think from that. From 10 to 30 feet, I went back by hand and looked at every single putt that he hit. And it was like, I'm making up this number now, it was like 20 putts in that range. He left 40% of them short. There is no chance when Phil Mickelson says I'm putting aggressively from 20 to 20 feet that you would think he's leaving almost half of them short. But it's how he felt. Total nonsense. So we've got to get that Mickelson, Hal Sutton mindset in there while not creating an overly aggressive shot pattern, I think is really the the, the takeaway there. That's a tough one, though. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. One of the things, Scott, I think that your system has done a really good job of is expectation management. Um, that's something that we've talked a lot with our players about, like, from eight feet, tour pros make 50% of their putts, like all that stuff. From, you know, one of the things that, that I think helps our parents a lot is from 100 yards, from 80 to 100 yards, tour average is like 18 feet, 20 feet. Like they're, you know, the, obviously the guys like Hal, were, they're all really good, but they're not robots that hit it to four or five feet every time. Um, so talk a little bit. Talk, I want you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of leave two or three things I want you to discuss. I want you to discuss expectation management, I want you to, to discuss strokes gained. I'm kind of a COVID idiot. So don't throw too many things on me. I'll have to make some notes. <laughs> so I want you to discuss expectation management a little bit and what you've learned as you've developed this system. And I want you to talk, I want you to briefly describe strokes gained to our audience at home. Well, just for ease, strokes gained, you know, you can't hit – putts per green and regulation doesn't take into account – how long the putts were greens and regulation doesn't take in, into account how many penalty shots you had or how long your average birdie putt is. There's just a lot of things that are left out there. Mark Brody again did an amazing job creating strokes gained. And just as an easy example, an eight foot putt is 50, 50, like you just said, meaning it takes one and a half strokes to hole out from eight feet. You obviously can't hit the ball one and a half times. So you either make it or you two putt. Hopefully you don't three putt very often, but if you make an eight foot putt, you have moved it one and a half strokes closer to the hole in one stroke. So you gained a half a shot in expectation against your playing, you know, your, your, your competition. If you two putt it, you've moved the ball one and a half strokes closer to the hole in two putts. You in essence lose a half a stroke. So if in back to back holes, you have an eight foot putt and you make one and you miss one, you have three putts in two holes, three divided by two is one and a half. That's how it works. Well, again, thanks to ShotLink and Mark Brody and MIT and all the smart people in the world, we know that from 162 yards in the fairway on the PGA Tour, they average three strokes to hole out. That's literally a pitching wedge for most of those guys, a nine iron, and they average three. It's again, and this is one of the pushbacks I get from PGA Tour players is, well, I'm not trying to be average. And I'm like, I understand that. But if you can beat the average by 0 0.05 and you do that 18 times, that's a full shot. Basically you're one of the best players on the planet. Would you take that? And when you start breaking it down to these fractions of shots and then just realizing if you make a bogey, you know, like in that situation from 140 where it's 2.91 strokes to hole out. If you make a par, you lose 0 0.09, no big deal. If you make a bogey, you lose 1.09. You've got to go play that hole you know, 10 or 11 times to earn that expectation back of the one what's probably was a stupid bogey. I mean, you just can't outrun those silly bogeys. And again, the main thing is, is like every time that you finish a round of golf and you think I should have shot lower, it's not because you didn't make a birdie from 210 or something. It's because you made a stupid bogey from 130. It's, it's because you three putted from 15 feet because you were trying to make it and jammed it five feet by and it's only 75% coming back. If you jam it five feet by, you're going to miss a certain amount of them. That's just a fact. And so that's really using those expectations and those numbers. Again, you've never met a bigger lunatic on the golf course than me. And it's how I definitely have calmed my brain down and, and just understanding, well, again, it's just poker math, taking a lot of poker math and, and the fact that, you know, if you get it all in and, and some guy hits a two outer on the river on you and, and wins the pot. If you're better than him, you just got to smile and be like, we keep doing that. I'm going to get it back like that. Congratulations. That's just part of the long run expectation. That's the mindset of trying to bring it to golf. And, you know, in, in poker, when you're getting mad, it's called tilted. And so we're trying to reduce being tilted in golf, which I truly would believe, especially with what I now know, 
and it's easy to say this since I don't have to, uh, to put it out there, but I really think that I could have been a top 30 or 50 player in the world. I had, I had those physical skills back in the day. I just had absolutely no clue how to play the game, but then mentally I had absolutely no clue how to stay present and emotionless. And, you know, I'll get some announcers, some of the older, you know, former tour players that say like, you know, I played better when the emotions were high. And I'm like, no, you played worse when the emotions weren't high. You can't play better than whatever your ability is. You just needed to figure out when it wasn't Sunday or your emotions were high, how to raise that game to your emotional level. But for the vast majority of people, removing emotions from decisions is what allows you to just stop wasting shots. Again, emotion, you can't make an over-optimal decision. Optimal is optimal. Now you just have to, to, to do that in the heat of battle and then obviously execute the, the physical portion of it. Well, Did I address any part of what you were talking about? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> How thoughts? Well, so this is something that crossed my mind while you were talking right there. Uh, my targets moved from week to week based on how I was hitting it. I would get more aggressive or less aggressive based on how I was hitting it. Yeah, I make several statements in here often where I really only felt on top of my game four or five weeks a year. The rest of the time, I was just really managing my game, what I had to work with. And by that, I mean my targets moved based on how I was hitting it. So do you think that's legitimate, me <laughs> saying that? I, I say that to people, if you feel like you're striping it, you can maybe take one off the decade baseline. But no matter what, shot patterns are just huge. But no matter what, if there's any wind whatsoever, shot patterns simply, they're just erratic. Like there's just, it is what it is. At 10 miles an hour isn't blowing 10 miles an hour. It's blowing five to 15. And, you know, the, they had the PXG robot that hit that hole in one on 16 at, at TPC Scottsdale a couple of years ago. Um, you know, that robot can pretty much in a controlled setting, put it on a two yard circle. It's a pretty damn good robot at golf. But that day I had a buddy that was out there working and he said that it was blowing like two to five downwind and off the right. And so, yes, that robot hit a hole in one, but it also missed balls in the green and the bunker left. The shot pattern became, there's like seven yards wide and 12 yards deep just because of a two to a five mile an hour wind. And now you take it all the way back there to Hideki at the top of the hill at 240 and it's blowing somewhere between five and 17 miles an hour. And I mean, that green, you don't have a whole lot of area to hit it and keep it on the green. You know, there's just certain times when he's striping, but it's like, dude, slow down. So what I will say to your point is like, okay, if you feel like you're striping it, sure, take one or two off. But you were also a PGA Tour player that had the experience to figure out if you knew what you're actually talking about there. And that, again, critically, if you rewind this thing back, you know, six years ago and, and Como set me up with my first PGA Tour veteran to work with, and I went out and worked with them, the guy's like, well, that's not how I see it. That's not how I see it. That's not how I see it. And I was like, I have no credibility with this guy because I caddied for a kid when he won the U.S. Junior. Or, or okay, Bryson won the U.S. Amateur. But this guy is just looking at me like he knows more than me. I'm like, I'm not going to fight this battle with veterans because it's hard to tell a 28-year-old who's made $10 million, you're doing it wrong. But that guy still hasn't won yet on tour either. And it's just interesting as a veteran how often they get this in their head that the way I do it is correct and it works. But more importantly, where I'm going with all this is when you actually see most people start playing more aggressively is actually when they're playing bad is counterintuitive as that seems because they turn it – three shots higher than their handicap would suggest, and they're going to go get it back. And, and that's when they, you know, a, a 72 kid in college turns it two over. They just stick to your game and you got a 74, not the end of the world. That guy starts chasing it, trying to force it when he's not playing good, and then turns a 74 or five into a 78 or nine. And in college, if you get two kids that do that on the same day, you're just done. And that's the thing that I would, I would say is that, even giving, I'm talking 25 years and younger, the right to do what you're saying, and like the right, like I have any actual eminent domain over them, but even giving them that right, they overdo it. And so while they might be right a few times a year, 
they overdo it because instinctively they just want to play more aggressively and make birdies and shoot lower. And it's just not, it's just not the way the game works. So it takes discipline and it is tough, but sure, but it's not necessary. So I have another statement to make here. <laughs> when I was young and dumb, 25 and under, I broke more course records. And after I got smarter and played more decade golf, I broke fewer course records. Did you win more money or win more tournaments? Uh, I won more money. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I mean, but. I would say we would need to actually go to the record books and see if your perceived memory is in fact correct. And it might be, but typically you're, if you think of a bell curve of average scores, when you take a player from playing too aggressively to playing correctly, the low end doesn't change much because it's just in an 18 hole round. Sure. It, it, you might shoot a couple of lower rounds, but you're literally talking maybe two or 3% of the time more. It, you know, when you, this gets back to kind of a mentality of a Monday qualifier and players will ask me, should I be more aggressive here? I'm like, if you're going to make it tomorrow, you're not going to call me and just be like, dude, I hit it inside of three feet for 18 straight holes. You're going to call me and be like, dude, I played the par fives. Well, I made the scoring opportunities with the sand wedge and, and gap wedge. Um, I made a 30 footer on a par three that was a nice bonus and I didn't make bogeys and give it back. That's the script in 80% of successful Monday qualifiers that you can go out and intentionally try to do to go out and intentionally try to stuff it for 18 straight holes. It's just, it's just not going to work out. And it is, a, again, it is a tough one because it sure does seem, it sure does seem lame thinking that you can play again, air quotes conservatively, but this last year, I, again, I'm literally not a member of the country club and I only use my own play. I'm here sitting here talking to you guys, one of the players twice and I'm bringing up my game as, 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 as backup for this, but I literally quit my home course four years ago because I finally had elbow surgery. I finally fixed it, but I wasn't playing any golf. I only play a couple times a year out at Merido with Zalatoris and Davis Riley and whoever. I literally don't play golf. And in the last year, I won my U.S. Mid-Am qualifier by four, shooting 66. I had the low round of the day um, two times in Q school in, in seven rounds against 22 to 25 year old professionals that in theory are probably playing every day. Um, you can go low with the correct targets by playing the par fives well and by, by just doing, it's funny when every, anytime you have like a, a buddy that plays in a, in a pro-am, the Nelson pro-am or something like that, like he shot 65 and it was just the easiest looking thing I've ever seen. 65s never look hard. He's, he hit it all over the map and it was wheels off and somehow shot 65. No, 70s can look wheels off. 65s always look simple. And the, the simple 65 is the one that we're going for on the Mondays or in those, those USGA type qualifiers. And yes, you're probably right. You might have gone lower. You're obviously one of the most talented golfers that's ever walked the planet. But I would also argue your overall scoring average was for sure higher, even if that is correct. And well, you finished with the correct thing because I actually shot higher scores too. Yeah. So, you know, because I took more chances when it worked out, I shot lower, but when it didn't work out, I shot higher too. So to do it for 72 straight holes. That's the key. Right. It just doesn't work out. Yeah. Honestly, I, and I thought about this earlier while you were talking, you know, people always go back to the Curtis Strange and Tiger Woods interview, you know, oh, you'll learn. And it's, yeah. that's a funny soundbite. But if you actually watch the rest of that interview, there's an amazing spot. And I think I've got it on my YouTube channel somewhere, but Curtis asked Tiger about playing in the U S open. That's, you know, where's going on. And, and he said that he had played with um, uh, Nick Price the year before. And we, he's like, we finished the first round and Nick shot like 68 and was leading. And we were having lunch and I asked him how many pins he fired it all day. And he said he didn't fire any. And he's like, and I fired it every single one of them that day. And then we went out the next day and we did it again. And I was paying more attention and we finished the round. And he's like, how many pins today? He's like, none. And he shot like 68 again and was leading. And he's like, I was just all over the place. I honestly believe that was probably the single most important tournament that Tiger ever played 
because it at least got him thinking there was more to this than what he was doing. And at the junior golf and amateur golf level, like he's just the greatest talent that's ever walked the planet. Like you can get away with it. But even at the PJ tour, he's still the greatest talent that's ever walked the planet. This is one where he's still only 20%. You still have to just set the cards up as well as you can and then just wait for those dominoes to fall wherever you can. It's just, you know, in tennis, if your name's not Nadal, Federer, or Djokovic, you probably haven't won a major in the last 20 years. That's just not how it works in golf at all. And so you get a guy like Spieth that comes out and wins, you know, 14 times in his first 140 starts a 10% win rate. This is unbelievable. I also was saying the whole time that he won't sustain this. There will come a lull. And the big question is going to be, does he retool or does he just keep doing what he's doing and trust like that's variance. Colin Morikawa, again, a kid that attended the decade seminar in college and Rick Sessinghouse does absolutely incredible work with him. Colin, love you, buddy. You're not going to maintain a 10% win rate for your entire, I don't want to say winter is coming, but he's going to go through a lull for a year or two where it just doesn't work out. Just keep doing whatever you were doing then. Don't go retool and try to, well, maybe I need to be hitting some draws. You didn't hit draws when you won the PGA. That's not it. Don't start searching. Go back to just doing what you do and be patient. Again, same thing with like DeChambeau when he went for that first 16 months with Como without winning. It's like, dude, just keep doing the same thing. And eventually it's going to, it's going to pan out. And, you know, here the guys won three or four times, whatever it is now in the last 10 months. It's, it's just pretty incredible to watch when you know what somebody's doing, how hard it is even still just to stay patient on it. Again, I just posted on Twitter today, the picture from, from Jordan making triple on nine in the first round. That shot he was trying, if you've seen it, had 0% chance of getting on the green. He's, you know, those right pine straws, it's so downhill. So even though the shot from behind him looked like there was a gap, those pine tree branches were lower than his ball. So he's trying to rip a full four iron, whatever it is, from 200 yards and actually make the ball go down so that way it can land in the fairway and run up onto the green. Like at best, that shot's getting to 60 yards short of the green. Or you could just pitch it out sideways to 120. Like, I get it, 60 yards is better than 120, but 120 100% of the time is better than 60 50% of the time. And here the guy makes triple on the ninth hole of the tournament. It's like, dude, again, I could tell you from Dallas, this shot has no chance. <laughs> I love the way you're thinking right there. Tell me something else. Who makes more difference to a PGA Tour player, his coach or his caddy? Well, I mean, the caddies these days are getting much better than they were back kind of in your day. It's funny, actually, I can't remember what your caddy's name was, but I came out and followed you around at the Byron Nelson one time in the late 90s. And I just thought it was incredible how, like, you're over your shot. And he would yell out, man driving or whatever it was, like, literally every single time. Because, like, any noise. But it was just, you may not even notice it. Because it's just, you know that, like, at this point over my ball, he's going to yell, everybody shut up. And... Those caddies that know exactly what they're doing and when to do it, it's unbelievable the, what they can bring. But then I'll also say again, like, and I get it, people give the our team thing of modern golfers a hard time. But I'm sorry, you get specialists like, like right now, like Josh Gregory. That guy is really, really good at teaching chipping and putting. You get Troy Denton, Will's full swing coach. That guy is really, really good at getting Will to hit the golf ball well. You got me. I taught him strategy for four years. Again, now I'm just a buddy that needs to bounce an occasional question off of. I hooked him up with Dr. Michael Larden for some sports psychology, you know, four or five years ago. I don't need to be interjecting anywhere in any of that stuff. I need to be a buddy for the occasional questions. But there you've got five people that legitimately have it. Plus his caddy. I'm sorry, I'm trying to bring him into also. His caddy does an amazing job. Um, you got five people in this kid's ear to some extent, but we're all harmonized in saying the same thing to some degree. It just reinforces that confidence. So done correctly, hopefully they're all on the same page. Done incorrectly, I mean, again, you see some stuff on Twitter with some caddies where it's like, that's wrong, that's wrong. I hope you're not saying it to him, but I'll also give a lot of them credit. A lot of them hit me up in direct message now asking questions about certain situations and you know, Tommy Fleetwood at, uh, on 18 at PGA National last year, 
he's got 245 in, he needs to make eagle on 18, and he puts it in the water, and you can tell he's trying to hit like a flare hybrid. I post on Twitter, he's not making eagle with his second shot there, he's making eagle with his third shot, but I tried to say it softly, and the next, literally the next morning, I'm standing on the range at Bay Hill, and his caddy comes up, and he puts his arm on, and he's like, so Tommy shouldn't be hitting whatever there. And I'm like, not really. And I look, I'm like, oh no, this is his caddy. Like you just forget these people. But we had a conversation and we've talked about it in DM on Twitter some now. And you get these guys like, it's kind of offensive to be like, yeah, you could have made a better decision there. Well here, but here's what we were working with. Okay, cool. Now I see that. And now let's figure out how you can make that decision maybe a little bit better. They're all out there. I mean, again, at this point it was Al Torres doing what he's done. And obviously my name getting to be mentioned as much as I, it has been with him. These people are all thinking along these lines now. Um, it's just a question of how they're going to pull that off. I mean, it really is. It's, it's why I called it decade. Just to imply we're going to take decades off your learning curve. And that's ultimately what I think it's accomplished. Like you say, here's your, just a great player that's won <laughs> the players twice. And you're like, yeah, that's kind of how I thought. But now we've just codified that that's repeatable emotion is not repeatable scott for amateurs if we if we segue to the you know and, and this this is a tough question because everybody's a little different but what's one or two things that you see that if amateurs quit making these mistakes they would they would improve their scores i mean to me if if you rename decade anything to me it almost be bogey avoidance you know you you talk a lot i mean i remember you gave a story about dustin johnson when he was sixth or seventh in the world and then went to first in the world. And it was similar to what Hal talked about. When he was sixth or seventh in the world, his low round was 64. When he was first, when he became number one, his low round was 65 or 66. But his high round was, wasn't was 78 or 79 anymore. It was 72 or 73. So to me, the thing that we try and get our players to do is quit making bogeys. Would you echo that for your five to 20 handicap? Like, where, where do you go with that? I mean, again, it really is just interesting. The math – it really is pretty straightforward. As your scoring average drops through the 70s, 70 to 80% of your improvement in score is from bogey and higher avoidance. Only 20 or 30% of it is from making more birdies. As your scoring average goes from 95 to 79, as it improves 16 shots, only one of those 16 shots is more birdies. And so this is where I, I do have a, a slightly different take again than Mark Brody, who I respect more than anything for creating all this, but he correctly, from a math standpoint, says the best players make the most birdies, but I would add comma because they can. Their shot patterns just allow them more birdies, mainly because they're typically longer. So on the par fives, they're getting up there and allowing to be more aggressive because they're getting more shots inside of 100 yards, certainly more shots up and around the greens chipping. But what they all also do is lead in bogey avoidance. And so, so much of what I search for is what is like prescriptive um, advice I can give you? What's actionable to take away from this? I can't really tell you go make birdies. Like, okay, how? Well, you got to get a lot better at golf. Well, that's not very helpful. But for the most part, people can go intentionally make fewer bogeys and for sure fewer doubles and triples. If you hit a driver out of bounds, but you had the correct target and you were committed to it and you just hit a terrible shot, whatever. I don't really care about that. But if you're Jordan Spieth in the trees on nine and make triple, you could have avoided that. And, and any 10 handicapper could have avoided that triple. Um, sure. There's times you're going to, you're going to lay it out to 120 and then you're going to miss the green and you're going to make double that way. Like that, that happens, but leaving, I mean, he's so lucky that ball didn't come back in the bush. Like I don't want to say he's lucky to have made triple, but hitting that tree as solid as he did, that could have been a whole lot worse, but it's funny because here he finally gets it out there short of the green, hits a nice chip shot up there to like six feet for bogey and hits that putt an inch low and five feet by. How is it possible to hit a putt an inch low and five feet by unless you were trying to jam in that first putt? <laughs> I mean, so here well, he is, he's over the putt and he's thinking, well, I don't want to make double. So I'm going to just take a little bit of this break out and jam this thing in. Well, you didn't make double. You made triple because you missed the five-footer coming back after that one. And I hate to laugh at it, but I could see that one coming also. Like, dude, this is not the putt to be aggressive on. Just hammers it by. And, and yes, it's all relative because that ball was creeping 
when it got by it got to the hole but that's the entire reason unfortunately jordan you've got yourself about a seven footer that breaks a foot for bogey <laughs> i hope you tap in for double and yeah. you know that ball just can't have that much speed right there and, and again real quick so and, and i'd love your take on this you know, we talk a lot about with our players, like each shot's its own set of circumstances. You enter in the information in the computer, it spits out a result. Like, would you agree with if we can avoid bogeys and take emotion out of as much of the decision making as we can, golfers will improve? I mean, there's literally no doubt. I mean, again, I, I, I really don't try to just mention players' names so that way people can think I'm cool or something like that. But at the end of the day, I mean, I did a seminar at Oklahoma State. A lot of those Oklahoma State players that you see out on tour have a, have a, back, a background in, in decade. Colin Morikawa, DeChambeau, Zalatoris, they attended my seminar in college. Doc Redman had the decade app through, through Clemson. And when he was struggling in 2018 just to make some cuts on the PGA Tour, he asked me to come caddy for him. Like, I tell you this because these young names that you're seeing out on tour are doing amazing things virtually all of them have some background in decade and the decade mindset truly is about mistake avoidance. I mean, again, I even say this thing again, just to drop more names, but Stuart Sink bought the app out of the app store last July and one, three weeks later, I felt like literally like, surely that's not the Stuart Sink. And I go check through and check the IP address. Like it's out of the right city. And, uh, you know, I, I really wasn't going to say anything about it ever, but a couple weeks later, I get a guy that sent me an email asking for, uh, for any advice because Stuart Sink had recommended the app to him. I'm like, here's a dude that's 50 years old. I feel like he's older than me. Here's a dude that's 50, a major champion. And even he's like, wow, maybe this is why I didn't win. And here he's won twice. Did he win again recently? I feel like he's won twice since he bought it. Um, it, it just is better. fun to, to watch guys even like that. Darren Clark bought the damn thing out of the app store. I mean, here's a Ryder Cup captain and, 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 and sent me thanks basically after he won twice on the Champions Tour. It's, it's, it is. It's comical. It really is because I truly did create this for my own game just to try to win the U.S. Mid-Am because I want to play in the Masters myself. That was the entire point of this venture and only because of that injury – when I caddied for Zal Torres, did this actually become apparently what I'm going to do with the rest of my life? <laughs> Al, Al, thoughts? Uh, you know, I think uh, I never really looked at it that way that you're uh, avoiding, but there were times where I felt like I was avoiding making mistakes. Uh, you know, one of the, I tell the story a lot about, uh, Tiger, one of the reasons why I think he's one of the greatest players that ever lived is because before he hit every shot, he did not fear the possibilities of the next one. I mean, think about playing golf where you knew wherever you hit this, I've got that shot. Yep. He's the only guy I've ever seen play the game that actually I could see that in him. And, uh, you know, there were – everybody, we, we all had a weakness. We were all aware of our weakness. That's something that you could talk about for a while. I mean, when you talk to a player and you're caddying for him, are you, uh, are you factoring in his weakness and the, your thinking? 100%. Well, I'm not factoring into the decision-making process. I'm factoring into the psychology of what I'm going to say to him. Um, Again, back to Zalatoris, and I, and I do say this, and at this point, it's only a matter of time. To, you know, I, he struggled with his putting when he was younger. Like, it, I tried to tiptoe around saying anything like that for a long time because I didn't want him to have his confidence dented. I, I think he's going to be just fine at this point. But at this point, I, I really do talk about it a little bit more openly because I want that next 15 or 16-year-old junior that's struggling with his putting to realize, hey, dude, Will went through the same thing, and he still does. I mean, he missed a short putt on 12 this week. It's it's not easy, but what I would say to a guy like Will after he missed a short putt at the Texas Amateur, I'd take him over to the side of the green. I'm like, did I tell you back on the first tee that you're going to win this tournament if you, if you just do what I tell you to do? And he's like, yeah, because he was getting kind of down and, and a little bit mopey. And I was like, 
I understand you just missed a short putt and, and that's not ideal, but you kind of struggle with your putting. Do you think I didn't know that back on the first tee? And he's like, I guess you did. I'm like, cool, then we're fine. Like, I knew you struggled with your putting then and I told you you're going to win. You just missed a short putt. I don't care. You're still going to win. Like, that was all factored into it already. And just to try to change the energy from dwelling on that. And that's when you watch the body language, especially of so many of these young guys. They get so down and so dejected and, and whatever. And, you know, it's easy to do when you're playing well, but Will hit some bad shots out there, period. I mean, he hit some bad shots. He hit a, a bad shot and a, 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 a tee shot on 12. He then went on and missed a four-footer um, on the same hole. By the time he walked off that green, it was over. Shoulders back, chest up. You know, Ryan Palmer's the guy that was on the golf team with it at Texas A&M. And the first time I caddied for Will out at Riviera back in 2015, I saw Ryan and I'm like, you know, I'm just, again, I'm just having fun. I'm just caddying for a buddy. Still I'm not trying to be decade at the time. And I just went up to Ryan, just chit chat. I'm like, you know, you're an interesting case. Like I never would have thought you would just be out here for 20 years and have seven wins or whatever it is. Like, why do you think it is? And he's like, honestly, I don't ever get down on myself. He's like, I watch all these other kids out here, the young players, and they always look like they're in a hurry. They're just running around everywhere. And then when they get mad, their shoulders, everything slumps. And it's like, does body language actually matter? I mean, arguably from a physiological standpoint, no. But standing there with your shoulders back and your eyes up does feel better, period. And Ryan Palmer's exact answer when I was like, why have you been out here for 20 years? He's like, I don't let my eyes get below the horizon when I'm mad. That was it. Not, I drive it well, I putt it well. I just don't get down on myself. And I'm sure he gets down on himself plenty, but he probably doesn't let it go on for 45 minutes. And he probably doesn't do it every single week. And I think that that's the main thing, like that I for sure see, you know, younger players, Morikawa, you know, again, back whenever I was playing unsuccessfully back in the 90s, I played in the 99 US Open at Pinehurst. I probably lost to you since I only beat about six people. But um, one of the main things that I took away from it is these guys, they just are all positive. I mean, I'm out there, the hottest head in the golf tournament, like slamming three woods. And I need somebody just to grab me and be like, what are you doing? There's no way this is going to lead to anything productive. At best, it's irrelevant, but most likely it's totally destructive. And are you a very happy person? Like, no. And so the reason I brought up Piners was back then, we all thought that Tiger was like playing hypnotized. Did you ever hear anything like that actually out on tour? Like we legit on the mini tours thought Tiger was hypnotized. What I'll tell you in hindsight now with knowing more about it, he was just playing golf in a meditative state. And that's what Zalatoris is doing. That's what Morikawa is doing. That's what these young guys that just step out there and own it from square one, from, from day one. That's why the announcers were freaking out, but I've never seen a young player look more prepared while being more out of, you know, out of his place. And like, that's because he has a daily practice of preparing for this round of golf. It's a three hour, basically moving meditation that he does from the moment he starts getting ready, three hours, the exact same song on a loop, ear pods in that come out when he walks onto the first tee, every single day. And that's why that kid gets out there. Nothing was, okay, it's the final round of the Masters, whatever. I mean, Jason Gore was in the same position in 05 at the US Open and shot like 82, I think. Um, no knock on Jason Gore. I love that guy. And he's one more on tour than I did. But he was totally unprepared for that exact moment. And that's the whole deal is you're going to get rattled. Bad things are going to happen in any given round of golf. Something bad is guaranteed to happen. So you have to be prepared for that. And, and you know, that a meditation practice, I used to feel a little weird about saying it. I felt like I should be selling avocado sandwiches out in California. But <laughs> I, at this point now, it's just understood Jordan, not Jordan Speed, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Phil Jackson, Pat Riley, Pete Carroll, all these prolific coaches, they all have their players doing the same meditation routine from a guy, George Mumford. I mean, it's it is this the 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 hidden secret i think of elite performance <laughs> interesting 
Oh, <laughs> that's about all. That's about what I expect. I, no, I've got to throw so, sandwiches too, if you want that no. instead of avocado. <laughs> so we, we've been we've been talking to to different um, um, different sports psychologists and neuroscientists and stuff, and and similar similar um, uh, prescriptions, I would say. Um, I haven't heard of the three hour the three hour hour meditation uh, routine. Um, Interesting. I'm, we're gonna have to look at that. Bring that up because I can't. I can't get my corn fairy players to do it ten minutes a day consistently. And I'm finally yeah. like, Zalatoris is doing it for three hours from the moment he gets in the shower to the moment he walks on the first tee. It's this song, Fading Fog, from Headspace, the meditation app. It's this this slow melodic song. And I literally finally told him a couple months ago. I'm like, dude, you need to make sure that you've actually got a backup of that he's like oh i got an hour of it just in case like they pull it off the the site i mean sure well and especially in the world we live in with all the distractions and the phone and all this stuff like it it, it needs to happen but i got i got one more question kind of question comment for you and see what your thoughts are on it and this kind of relates to will you know i was at a seminar you did and you you mentioned that will was you know one of the best ball strikers in the world and one of the worst putters in the world and to me i think that's a mindset this was seven six seven years ago five six years ago but we talk a lot to our that that back in case he listens <laughs> sorry um so we we talk a lot with our players about you know as you develop as a ball striker you've got to be really careful with your putting because you're going to see more putts missed and what I mean by that, if, if you hit it to 10 feet on every hole, you've got a 40% chance of making all those 10 footers where from a mind standpoint, if you hit three or four greens and a lot of times, you know, you'll have those rounds where, man, I, you, you do it out of necessity. You chip it to four or five feet, you make the putt for par and even lose, lose mentioned that, you, you know, guys make more five footers for par than they do for birdie or something along there. Right. What, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts with Will? Like, He's such a good ball striker that he's he's seen so many putts missed, and it's it's hard on the mind to keep you know to keep going and and to not think you're a bad putter. Meditation, I mean that. So so a few years ago, I would have incorrectly said you know the goal of meditation is to have no thoughts. Well, that's a rookie thing to say. The goal of meditation is not to have no thoughts. It's to recognize a ruminating thought pattern. You're looking for these just scripts that we run constantly. And that's when you're just like, whoa, that's a pointless thought. You start recognizing those things quicker. And then you either just kind of laugh at it and set it aside and move on. Or if you just can't get rid of it, then that's when you go to like literally trying some sort of a, a moving meditation where you're just walking and following your breath because you're just trying to distract your mind again. The, the 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 meditation app that I recommend so often is a guy named Sam Harris. He has a, a meditation app called Waking Up, but then he also has these lessons in it that are just like five to seven minute essays. And I tell players listen to the essay; it's just good information. But then go back and listen to it again, and pause it every so often, and think about what he's saying in a golf context. And that's the, that's the key. And, and the reason I brought up Sam is because he's got this just amazing line where he, he says, he's like, your mind is the most incessant, awful person ever. If, if your mind walked in the front door of your house and just followed you from room to room saying to you what it's actually saying to you, you would shoot it dead in under 30 seconds. I mean, every one of us would commit murder of our own brain. But because it's this conversation going on in our head, we don't really recognize it's an option to kill it. it. It is an option. I needed somebody whenever I was 24 years old and playing in the U.S. Open be like, hey, buddy, that's not working. You can choose to at least slow that down. Again, I had the crutch of, you know, my dad was kind of a hothead on the golf course, so I'm a hothead on the golf course. You know, it's just who I am. And that's the thing I try to get players to realize. That's just because you don't want to put the work in to change it. It ain't easy. And give it, you know, wait until you're 40 and see how much harder it is to change. You know, I've been working on this for 13 years at this point, And I still have my moments where I just laugh at myself. Like, I mean, I did it with Michael Finney just last week where I called him up on the phone and I just lost my mind on him. And I was laughing at him myself the whole time because I'm like, what is the point of this? I was so mad at him. I couldn't help myself, but just rail on him. And obviously it's utterly pointless. He's not listening to a word I'm saying. So I need to, needed to, again, I'm, I'm saying that story because 
even I'm not infallible on this and I've been working on this really hard for a long time. That's the thing that you start giving yourself a little bit of grace, a little bit of latitude to make mistakes. And again, I, I do say it all the time. Like I hope you shoot lower scores if you buy the decade app, but at the end of the day, I really don't care, but I really do want to impact you mentally and help you live a better life. I mean, I really, um, I, I really do believe that an understanding in some of these principles will help you in your schoolwork, your relationships, your parenting, how you interact with Michael Finney on Twitter, any of these different ways, it will help. You'll still not be perfect, but you'll hopefully be a little bit better than you were. When, when I was going to introduce you, I was going to you know, say how many players you've helped and, and all this stuff. And I was going to also talk about how many, how many wars you've fought on the internet, on Facebook and Twitter with different, with different people. We, we joke about that. I'm like, Scott, just stop. You're, you, they're never going to win this one. But I'm getting better. I'm, I'm slowly getting better. <laughs> the problem is I'm right. <laughs> That's the problem. I just can't let it go. Hey, we're all right all the time. Unless a hundred percent of the people on Twitter understand that I'm right and eventually admit it I can't let it go <laughs> apparently that's uh apparently that's a problem in my life but we'll, we're getting there <laughs> awesome awesome Scott how you got anything got anything else uh Scott we appreciate you being on today uh it's been a valuable lesson to all of us you know we're all uh, I'm 63 years old this month and you know I still think I'm learning daily about a game that I've dedicated my life to, and, uh, you know, I know this kids are more accomplished today than they were in my era. They come out better prepared and it's because they've got a good team of people around them and they know more, literally they know more than we did. And, uh, it's exciting to watch how good the game is today and how good the people are in the game. And thanks for being part of that group, uh, Scott. Thank you. And it, honestly, it is, uh, it really is kind of a pinch me moment because I, I was right there watching on TV, you know, be the right club today. Like I've, you know, I've, I've watched it all. And I mean, you were the one that hold it out on four at Sawgrass one time, didn't you? When you won, didn't you hold out there or something? Didn't? Well, that was actually when I was defending, I hold it twice yeah. on four. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I remember that just again, just the thought of sitting here and, and having a conversation with you as though I have anything to bring to the table. It, uh, it is fun, but like you say, it really is, just the data painting a much clearer picture. And, you know, another thing that I took issue with on Facebook this weekend was a guy said, you know, it's great to see Zalatoris just out there raw and gunslinging. I'm like, he is literally by far the most educated player almost on the PGA tour from a data standpoint, Bryson included. And again, like both those guys I worked with when they were amateurs and professionals and will understands how to get play, play the game score in the game better than, I mean, honestly, potentially anyone's ever walked the planet. I mean, Tiger and Jack included, because even they had, I got to get this angle. I got to use this slope. I got to do this. And you'll probably at some point here, will say, I tried to use this slope. That's just part of the shot pattern. Again, like, yeah, I used the slope on 16 to funnel it down there. His target would not have changed with or without that. And to just watch a kid go out there and just stick to it. I mean, the holes that I told people on, 2, 5, 10, 13, he's going to hit three wood there no matter the situation and draw it. And to just watch that pan out and people just still not get it on Twitter. And like, but he's got to be better off hitting driver there. And like, no, he's not. He just finished second. <laughs> like, this is how it works. And again, hopefully with, the, uh, with successes like that, I can stop having yell it so much but well thanks again scott we really appreciate you coming on and um i'm sure we will uh we'll have you back uh to talk more about about certain stuff and twitter arguments and facebook arguments and let you let you ran a little bit so uh thanks again for for all the you know all the stuff you've done to, to help grow this game and for you know your story is really cool and uh you know we've we've appreciated our friendship and um yeah we look forward to having you back and look forward to seeing will and all your players playing great appreciate it thank you thanks scott thank you hal all right what'd you think that was that podcast was pretty good yeah Scott, you know he's he's great he's confident yeah. uh he's done a great job he's he's complete you know he's working on it every day yep. and i you know to me 
uh, if you're a golfer trying to be the best you can be, you want somebody that's working at it every day, learning and getting better and sharpening their tools and everything else. Yeah, I mean, it says a lot when, when a Stuart Sink or a um, uh, Darren Clark, you know, buys the app just to see what it's all about. You know, I think, I, and that's one thing I've I've admired and and learned about you how inquis- inquisitive you you still are and have been about. You know, trying new training aids and just trying to do anything you can to, to help you help you play better, and I think it's awesome. Well, I hated training aids when I was playing, and you know that's just maturity on my part. You know, I didn't, I have matured to know that a training aid can help me get better at something that I'm struggling with. Yeah. And I mean, we use training aids in here all the time if we think they're going to help. Yeah. And you know, I. Scott's an incredible, uh, he's a mathematician, you can tell. Yeah, super and smart. He's super smart. And uh, uh, I learned a lot today. I hope you all did too. What did you think about the angles? You know, his his talk about the thing that, here's the one thing I think Scott's helped me understand. And, and, and you and I have spoken on this a lot. Like, I always thought tour pros were perfect. Like, I thought you guys just, you, I hit it bad, you didn't. And uh, not saying that tour pros aren't that good, but, but, again they're not machines they you guys were that good for four or five weeks a year and and i thought you had to be that good all the time and and to me his angle theory is pretty interesting in the fact that if you're going to take on an angle or try and hit it to the right side of a fairway or left side of a tight fairway your miss your miss right could get you in more trouble than if you just aimed down the middle and 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 took your chances per se yeah well you know i mean that's the one area where scott and i are not a hundred percent on board with each other and this is a great example this week at harbor town because it's really tight it looks like there's more fairway out there than there really is uh because you can like for instance you hit it down the left hand side of 15 you don't have a shot yeah so you can't tell me that angles aren't important there but scott's theory is is that you know uh it's the highest percentage to aim it where he's saying aim it If you hit the most shots, you're going to hit the best shots if you aim it in this particular area. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mentioned in the podcast about Hogan telling me that he played, and after he finished every hole, he would look from the green back into the fairway to figure out where the best angle to come into the green from. You know, there's one of the greatest ball strikers that ever played the game. And, right. you know, my dad used to say to me, if it was good enough for Jack Nicholas, it's good enough for you, Hal. Well, I would say the same thing about Ben Hogan. If it's good enough for Ben Hogan, it's good enough for anybody listening out there. But here's the one thing we have really evolved yeah. as golfers. And, You know, we did the best we could. Hogan did the best he could with what he had. We have a lot more now. So if you're a golfer out there listening right now, pay attention to what's on the market today. Be in the 21st century with what we have right right now. Be inquisitive. Don't don't take everybody's, you know, everything verbatim. Like be inquisitive and go figure it out and see if it helps. And if it doesn't, throw throw it out. You know, I think... um, my big takeaway from Scott's system and what we try and preach to our, our kids is, and, and our, our better players, take emotion out of the decision mm-hmm. um, and try to eliminate, you know, for the, for, the, for the juniors growing up, it's the big numbers, trying to eliminate doubles and triples, especially penalty-free doubles and triples because they should never happen. But try to eliminate the, the bogeys and the doubles and the triples. And I thought his stat on, like, the guys going from 90 to 75, it was like one or two birdies difference. Like right. that, that was pretty powerful to me. I'm like, wow, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I made an analogy with a kid the other day about golf being, so if you're a 75 shooter, golf is basically a math test with 75 individual math problems. And you can't let a math problem on number two affect your decision of a math problem on, on number 60. And if you can treat each shot as an individual math problem, you've got a better chance of stuff you've talked about, staying in the present one shot at a time, just all the important stuff that, that you have to do on the golf course. Well, that's part of maturing, to yeah. be honest with you, where you realize that I can't let something affect me on the second hole all the way to the you know, the 17th hole, as you mentioned, you know, one of the things we talked about on the podcast was how Jordan Spieth shot on number 12 several years ago affected not only him, but many others that saw it. And, and, you know, 
That's where Scott's pretty smart about this stuff. Take the emotions out of all this. Make decisions and commit to them. We talk about it all the time in here. We've talked about it a lot on the podcast. Commitment to the end. Don't stop being committed anywhere until here. Amen. You know, I thought it was interesting at the end. He he talked about the importance of meditation. Yeah. Did did you guys do any of this stuff? Like, was there? I know you're gonna laugh at that. But was there any anybody that that you know was? And, and let me let me ask you this: Was there a way that Hal Sutton quieted his mind? Not necessarily on like away from the golf course. Was there a way where you were like, okay, I got to get away from everything and just kind of chill out a little well, bit? Well, I've talked about it on here before. You know, when I found the spot on the green as small as I could. I mean, that was my form of meditation by trying to block all the other thoughts out. Yeah. And, you know, I see Scott's point in yeah. that. And, you know, so I'm a big believer that that's probably a right thing yeah. to do and especially in again today's day and age with all the phones and distractions yeah, there's too many distractions in today's yeah. world yeah easy to think about other things sure well hope you guys enjoyed it again take emotions out of your decision making on the golf course quit making big numbers quit making doubles and triples um the quickest way to lower your score is to quit making bogeys so we uh we've been a big fan of scott's stuff go check out decade golf um if you guys have any questions about how we use it or or you know, you know, questions for, you know, some of the strategy stuff on there. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. You know, again, if you've got any specific questions you guys want us to answer, uh, fire away. Um, uh, we've got some, some cool new guests coming up and we're excited about them. And, uh, again, let us know if there's anything you need from us. Enjoy Harbor Town this week. For all those guys that were disappointed in their master's finish, I made that drive from Augusta a lot of times to Harbor Town and really disappointed in my finishes at Augusta and Harbor Town was a place for me to redeem myself. So keep that in mind as they play the tournament this week. Could be some of that going on. Great stuff. Thank you guys. Be the right club today. Yes!